Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Uh, it's uh, already 11, so should we start? Let's begin. Yeah, Ishita, please begin. Assuredly, please begin. So, good morning, all. Uh, internal Quality Assurance Cell IQSC, in collaboration with the Department of Political Science, Scottish Church College, welcomes you all. Our respected principal, Madam, Dr. Orpita Mukherjee, our vice principal, Sir, Dr. Shubhratin Das, our honorable resource person, Dr. Kalpala Kannabiran, and our IQAC coordinator, <coughs> Dr. Shomrat Bhattacharji. I'm also welcome, welcoming our faculty members of Scottish Church, our beloved students, and also the participants from all over India. Today's webinar is on uh, the gender inscriptions and constitutional imaginaries, rights, identities, intersections, and a way forward. So now I would like to request our principal, Madam Dr. Orpita Mukherjee, to say a few words and begin the program. And I, I would also like to mention that this program is being recorded and also we are having live streaming on YouTube. Now over to Dr. Orpita Mukherjee. Thank you, Ishita. Professor Kalpana Karnabiran, Professor and Director, Council for Social Development, Hyderabad. Dr. Shupratin Das, our Vice Principal, Dr. Samrat Bhattacharji, our IQAC coordinator, Dr. Ishita Shur, head Department of Political Science, dear guests, colleagues, and my dear students. I welcome you all to this webinar on gender inscriptions and constitutional imaginaries, rights, identities, intersections, and a way forward. Organized by the Department of Political Science, in collaboration with the IQAC of the college. At the very outset, I would like to take this opportunity to thank Professor Karnabiran for taking time out from her busy schedule to share her insightful thoughts on this extremely topical theme with us today. The gender identity of men and women can be seen in terms of the representation of women and men in a variety of domains, economic, social, political, religious, and cultural. We are aware that society and culture create gender roles. And these roles are prescribed as ideal or appropriate behavior for a person of that specific sex. For example, a boy plays with cars while a girl plays with dolls. A boy is presented with kits that teach him to assemble cars and airplanes, which he can play with, whereas a girl is given kitchen sets and embroidery sets. From childhood, a boy is traditionally taught to be an outdoor person, whereas the girl must learn to spend more time indoors. Gender identity can be seen in historical terms as the ways in which the identities of men and women were constructed in any region. Gender role is what society expects of each gender and imagines each gender. Even specific colors are allotted to the genders, blue for boys, pink for girls. Women are trained to be emotional. Men should not show their emotions. As society saw emotional men as weak. However, an individual's identity consists of multiple intersecting factors, including gender, race, ethnicity, class, and sexuality. The term intersectionality, as we all know, was coined by Kimberley Crenshaw, a legal theorist of race and feminism in 1989. The law in the US dealt with racial discrimination and sex discrimination separately. This meant US courts could not deal with discrimination claims involving gender and race combined. Crenshaw put forward an analysis 
that focused on the intersection of gender and race. To express this, she used the term intersectionality. Gender discrimination is a problem faced all over the world by the enlightened and the unenlightened, by white and colored women, and also by those belonging to the LGBTQ plus communities. But times are changing and things are looking up. Today, we are all eagerly waiting to hear a very inspiring and informative discourse on the subject. So without further ado, I pass on the screen to our vice principal, Dr. Shupratim Das. Thank you. A very good morning. Today's speaker, Professor Kalpana Kannabiran, Principal Dr. Orpita Mukherjee, my colleagues in the departments, various departments of the college, viewers, participants, and ladies and gentlemen. Really, it's my pleasure to say a few words in this uh, webinar on gender issues. As I'm not a specialist, and already there is a specialist waiting to to, to enlighten us on this particular theme, I would just touch upon very few fragmentary issues and episodes. We know that women's rights are human rights. Yes, women's rights are human rights. But in India, women's rights are violated frequently in day-to-day -day life, in the family, in households, and in the public domain. In a patriarchal society, women often suffer in silence, deprived of personal liberty, and bound by rules made by the allegedly superior males. According to Article 15 of the Indian Constitution, discrimination cannot be made among citizens on the grounds of religion, race, caste, or sex. There is an elaborate system to protect the rights of Indian women, including the Dowry Prohibition Act, the anti shoti Act, and the Protection of Women from Domestic Violence Act. There is, however, a need for proper implementation. That is the question, that is the issue. That is the burning issue, need for proper implementation. Moreover, we all know, laws do not automatically change the social structure. Laws cannot change the social structure automatically. They simply set a code of conduct. Women in India are not at all adequately represented at the political level, both at the center and in state governments. And this is true even about the Communist Party. At a community level, male dominance in the army, bureaucracy, judiciary, parliament, and police force limits the political power in the hands of women. Nonetheless, it has often been argued that women's political leadership could bring about a more cooperative, a more effective, a more fruitful, and less conflict-prone world. Look at Canada, Germany, New Zealand, Iceland, Norway, Denmark, or Finland, just some examples today, particularly in the backdrop of the COVID-19 pandemic. How are they managing? How are these countries managing? Although the Constitution of India prohibits forced labor and the trafficking of human beings, these practices continue to flourish. Article 39 of the Constitution in the Directive Principles of State Policy 
asserts that the state shall secure equal rights of livelihood for women and equal pay for equal work. However, women are paid far less for the same work and most urban and industrial jobs are rarely available to them. Even in the four metros, Delhi, Mumbai, Chennai and Kolkata, there is a very strong bias I have seen this in my own eyes against women in so-called white collar jobs. A survey by the Associated Chambers of Commerce and Industry of India recently revealed that only 3.3%, I repeat, 3.3% of women are promoted to top positions. While under the Maternity Act, women workers in certain industrial establishments receive maternity leave with wages most women in rural areas and in the informal urban sector are denied the benefit according to an estimate by the national commission on self-employed women 94 percent of the female workforce operates within these highly exploited sectors a large proportion of women workers are denied social security to which they are legally entitled under existing labor laws. In fact, already we have seen law and community reforms must go hand in hand. While laws may not remove structural inequalities, they can assist in bringing about social change. Literacy, health, and other necessities are basic rights that must be given to women to enable them to improve their position in the social strata by changing their economic status. This would go a long way in giving them political power as well. I would conclude with just a few more comments. There is a need for greater awareness through education and work on the culture of non-violence and non-bias. Social attitudes and beliefs, including those of judges and police officers, must be gender sensitized. Inculcating values in men and boys to regard women as equal partners in life and society would go a long way in increasing their respect for women's human rights and play a vital role in the nation's progress. I would just say one more sentence. Political participation is crucial in any country because this is not only a symbol of women's development and empowerment, but also creates further awareness and mobilizes other women to enter the political arena to promote their own social interests and interests of the country as such. With these few words, I would conclude I thank the organizers and I expect that we are going to have a very fruitful webinar and discussion and interaction today. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Now I would uh, like to take the opportunity to introduce Professor Kalpana Kannabiran, our honorable speaker. Uh, first, I would like to say that she is the professor and director in the Council for Social Development, Hyderabad. But this is not one and only identity for her. Uh, due to my personal contact with her, I, can, uh, I would like to mention a few more words if I can do justice to this introduction. She is a sociologist, activist, feminist lawyer, and an authority in gender and women's studies. Dr. Kalpana Kannabiran received the Rockefeller Humanist in Residence Fellowship at Hunter College, City University of New York in 1992-93. The VK v. R. V. Rao Prize for Research in Social Sciences focusing on social aspects of law in 2003 and the Amartya Sen Award for Distinguished Social Scientists 2012. She has been a member of the expert group on the Equal Opportunities Commission, Government of India, 
and a general secretary of the Indian Association for Women's Studies. She is currently the member of the executive committee of the International Sociological Association 2014 to 18. Now, to further, her biodata is so lengthy that it is simply impossible to exhaust this biodata within such short span of time. But I would definitely like to mention a few of her authored and co-authored books and articles. She has published books and articles in esteemed international and national journals. So I would start with a few books. Uh, Tools of Justice, Non-Discrimination and the Indian Constitution, New, New Delhi, Rotledge, 2012. From Mathura to Manorama, 25 Years of Resisting Violence Against Women, New Delhi, Women Unlimited, 2007. Telangana Social Development Report 2018, Gender, Access and Wellbeing, Hyderabad, Council for Social Development 2018, co-editor with Padmini Swaminathan. Representing Feminist Methodologies, Interdisciplinary Explorations, New Delhi, Rotledge 2017, co-editor with Padmini Swaminathan. Indian Social Development Report 2016, Disability Rights Perspectives, New Delhi, Oxford University Press 2017, co-editor with Asha Hans, and Violent Studies, Oxford India Studies in Contemporary Society, Delhi, Oxford University Press 2016, Women and Law, Critical Feminist Perspectives, New Delhi, Sage 2014, and too many more. Um, I would also like to mention a few of our forthcoming books, uh, Law, Society and Justice, Collected, Collected Works of Upendra Bakshi, Volume 3, Sociology of Law, New Delhi, Oxford University Press, forthcoming 2019, Gender Regimes and Politics of Privacy, Constitutional Conversations on Sociality in India. Delhi Zuban co-authored with Sweta Balakrishnan. And lastly, I would like to also add a few of our forthcoming articles. In the footprints of Banwari Devi, Feminist Cascades and Me Too in India, in Contribution to Indian Sociology, Volume 53, February 2019, and another one, Frontiers of Law and Society in India, interview with Upendra Bakshi Kalp in Kalpana Kanabiran, edited Law, Society and Justice, collected, collected sorry, works of Upendra Bakshi, New Delhi, Oxford University Press, forthcoming 2019. As I mentioned earlier, it is simply, it's simply impossible to exhaust her lengthy biodata, but what I can add that she is a real authority, real authority in gender studies and women's studies. Now, ma'am, it is our privilege to have you with us today for today's webinar. And now it's over to you. We are looking forward to wonderful session with you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Ishita, uh, for the invitation and uh, for the very kind uh, introduction uh, it always gets a little embarrassing uh, to have a long introduction because after all what do academics like us do we spend our life doing research and writing and teaching so if we don't write then we don't work so uh, it it's just part of my calling but i am honored to be here uh, I uh, also thank uh, Dr. Arpita Mukherjee for her kind comments and the Honorable Vice Principal for his introductory prefatory remarks. Um, I uh, wanted to uh, start with a bit of an explanation of what I will present today. Uh, when I speak of constitutional imaginaries, I'm not actually speaking uh, directly of the Constitution per se, but of the underlying uh, principles and ethics and philosophies uh, that have shaped 
the Indian constitution into what it is today. Uh, the work that I present today uh, is uh, part of a book project uh, that is in press, uh, of which uh, Sweta Balakrishnan is uh, co-author uh, on the right to privacy. Uh, but what I'm going to do is to just focus on one, uh, one part of it that looks quite centrally at identities and intersections uh, in terms of caste and community. Uh, and what, what that, how that helps us to understand uh, intersections, laws, the implement, unimplementation of laws, for instance, um, or uh, the situation of women today. And not just women, but um, all uh, no, women and uh, non-binary, uh, non-cis persons uh, who are the target of gender-based oppressions uh, in this country, which is extremely patriarchal and misogynist. Uh, so my paper, uh, Gender Inscriptions and Constitutional Imaginaries, Rights, Identities, Intersections, and a Way Forward. On August 24th, 2017, a nine-judge bench uh, in the judgment of the Supreme Court of India in Justice K.S. Putuswamy versus Union of India, held that the right to privacy is a fundamental right under the Constitution. While I will not have the time today to elaborate on this judgment in any detail, I will offer some vignettes that problematize the idea of privacy and open out its gender inscriptions, leaving us with the question of the constituents of constitutional imaginaries and the intersectional articulation of rights therein. Gender privacy in India cannot be understood without acknowledging that caste Hindu society is the ontological ground on which the claim to privacy stands. It is therefore caste and Hindu majoritarianism that frames dominant consciousness and reasoning and is the epistemic basis for judicial reasoning. Individual, communal and collective action and institutional dynamics takes shape in this context of graded essentialized imaginations of the self, the other, the foe, and the abject victim in need of saving. Humiliation and dispossession are constitutive of this context. The question posed by Jasimuddin, filmmaker Mrinal Sen's friend, to Sen's mother and her refusal to answer the question, and I quote, mother, if it is true that I am one of your sons, why do you feed me sitting me outside? Why is it that you never let me sit with your sons to eat from the same plate?" Unquote, quoted in Deepesh Chakrabarti 2002. And the similar refusal of Hindus, according to research conducted by Ritu Menon and Kamla Bhasin on the partition, the refusal of the Hindus to maintain roti beti ka rishta with Muslims, it has been argued, point to the ontological expulsion of Dalit in Muslim from caste Hindu orders through practices of untouchability and humiliation, even in contexts of putative kinship and fraternal intercommunal solidarities. But there is a different viewpoint that Anis Kidwai suggests in the course of her work on communal conflict in North India, in the same context of partition that Jasimuddin speaks of, which suggests different inflections of privacy. Immediately on entering a village close to Delhi with Pandit Jaydev, to resolve the problem of the forced conversion of Muslims, the Pandit asked for a hookah for the Gaur Brahmins, which was given. When mocked by Kidwai, the Pandit, not without speech like Sen's mother, so I wonder was his ability to speak a function of gender, but the Pandit said, Apaji, too much is made of Apaji. <laughs> Too much is made of eating and drinking together. The real thing is mutual love. True Hindus and Muslims have never eaten together. Sorry, is there a disturbance? Okay. Can I continue? Yes. Yeah. True Hindus and Muslims have never eaten together. But tell me, despite this, why has there been such little animosity between them?" Unquote. A question to which Anis Kidwai, 
I quote, had no comeback. Interestingly, again, it is the woman who has no reply. It was neither a practice nor a retort Kidwai was comfortable with, but forced to reflect on the effects of his presence on the ground in a fractured context where Muslims had been forced to convert in an attempt to restore their dignity and undo their humiliation, she conceded, albeit reluctantly, that, I quote, truly before this violence, Hindus and Muslims had been fast friends. Though taboos remained inflexible as always, both friends wouldn't take offense at these proscriptions, rather respect them as proscriptions of each other's fates. Now that untouchability was eradicated and food and drink had become one, we were bent on destroying each other." Unquote. Both these, Jasimuddin's question and Pandit, the Pandit's assertion and Kidwai's reflection are specific to a context and point to the difficulties of thinking through privacy in matters of faith at a particular, in a sense, originary historical moment while the constitution was still in the making. Seven decades into a constitutional democracy, the question before us painfully is, how have these concerns shifted? Have they in fact shifted? Fragile and eviscerated as the forging of citizenship might be, as Tanvir Fazal, Fazal argues in the case of Muslims, the challenge in claiming this space provides occasion to claim the constitution as commons, using the medium of the right to privacy in a manner that is cognizant of the present time where Dalits and Muslims are fused together by their untouchability in the dominant Hindutva imaginary as also importantly by their special constitutional claims that challenge this ousting, the hold holders of constituent power in a manner of speaking. I turn now to B.R. Ambedkar's refusal to make a farce of our constitution and build a palace on a dung heap, unquote, and Periyar's insistence that, I quote, the philosophy of abolition desires to do away not only with the cruel, cruelty all of us experience, but also to cleanse us of the degradation and horror we carry within ourselves, unquote. Our exemplary is the setting out of the contours of an insurgent ontology for the constitution that challenges the impunity guaranteed to the perpetration of continuing horrors of wounding, maiming, and terrorizing Dalits and Muslims through practices of untouchability and violence by state and non-state actors. The radicalism in recognizing egalitarian standards for women and men for Ambedkar is evident in Buddha's view that women, irrespective of status, married, unmarried, widows, prostitutes, because they were rational beings capable of intellectual communion, unquote. It was this standard that Hindu religion could not meet. The fraught relationship of Adivasis with land, especially forests, has been at the center of the Adivasi imagination of freedom and self-rule. This is a theme I defer for reasons of time to a separate lecture. Constitutional courts in India, in the course of expanding the reach of fundamental justiciable rights under part three of the Indian constitution, have interpreted dignity as being an intrinsic part of the right to life. Thus, the right to life has come to mean, or at least come to mean ideologically, the right to life with dignity, as presumably absent dignity, there can be no affirmation of life. This standard is not one that fluctuates. The right to life cannot be based on an interpretation of life as bare life, for instance. But the contours of the ideology itself are a little bit less clear and there are few markers that signpost how dignity may be understood. Therefore, it is necessary for us to turn to pathways of dignity. So the first segment of this lecture is pathways to dignity. One, resisting caste and interrogating humiliation. Beyond democracy in an egalitarian society, the focus on human dignity as the measure of the right to life and personal liberty and the embedding of privacy in human dignity paves the way for a new constitutional common sense, especially with respect to caste. 
Anti-caste and Dalit politics and their subversive retrieval have been coined around dignity historically. In the Dravidian anti-Brahmin movement, for example, an abstract but central virtue <clears throat> was encapsulated in slogans such as Kadame Kaniyam Kattapadit, that is duty, dignity, discipline, which were aimed at bestowing non-Brahmin youth with pride and dignity to be able to have self-respect that leaders like Periyar thought was central to uprooting the caste system. Similarly, dignity within the self-respect movement, especially as it pertained to the woman's body, was a way to unprejudice the Brahmin burdens, Brahminical burdens of chastity and purity and afford the self-respecting woman independence and a principle of recognized equality. We use these references to reflect on how Dalit and Abrahmani traditions help us elucidate and illuminate the idea of dignity, anchoring it in radical historiographical traditions that reinforce their deep meanings and import. The reclaiming of a space of dignity in caste order hinges centrally on a recovery of the history of resistance against humiliation and the deep oppressions constitutive of caste. A resistance that in the, in the first instance involved a theorizing of caste, drawing on the experience of subjugation as, and I quote Gopal Guru and Sundar Sarukai, the specificity of experience seems to demarcate different notions of self and community, unquote. Attempting an exploration of the autonomy of the category of humiliation as distinct from exploitation or suffering, Guru observes, that I quote, humiliation has been a recurring concern, a recurrent concern in the literary genre where it has operated through very powerful allegories, through metaphors like poison bread, jutan, or branded. Rather than argue simplistically that humiliation involves the treatment of human beings in an inhuman manner, Guru argues that the specificity of the politics of rejection in the caste order invests greater worth in animals than in certain classes of humans. It pushes Dalits out of visibility and out of the realm of imagination, rendering them completely unseeable, unapproachable, and untouchable, walking carrion, unquote. This obsession with purity and its distance from what is deemed impure is central to the violence and invisibility that is intrinsic to the caste system. Embedded within these logics of what is acceptable and what is to be rejected is the dominant conflation of the obnoxious body with filthy reality. And I quote Guru there, the velivada or cherry dichotomy that accords handling night soil and carcass removal expressions of existential humiliation and untouchability and the imagery and lived reality that must occupy the centerpiece of any theoretical overture. Mapping the embeddedness and epistemology in experience and the emergence of theory from experience, Guru and Sarukai trace Baba Sahib Ambedkar's critique of orthodox Hindu textual traditions to its grounding in the category of experience, which for them is a source of reflective consciousness it denies the text the advantage of being authorial. Orthodoxy then in its creation required a stripping of relative dignity from the have-nots, a creation of a profane sacred dichotomy to echo Durkheim that could ensure a systemic reproduction of a core and inherent ascribed individual identity sealed across generations. Drawing attention to Jyotiba Phule's conceptualization of Brahman Shahi or the rule of Brahmins, Samina Dalwai opens out the caste gender nexus that straddles cultural hegemony, consent, and control over economy and polity. The maintenance of a binary between good, passive Gharandas women and bad, erotic, lower caste women is critical to the reproduction of the caste order and dominant caste hegemonies. But orthodox ritual and custom was not just meant to create and protect purity for caste. It extended to very specific forms of caste male privilege, dominant caste male privilege. 
invoking individual dignity and communal honor, gendered humiliation offered a sharp weapon to maintain hierarchy to Dalit Bahujan women and women and dominant caste women. In examining the architecture of the caste system, Ambedkar sees endogamy as embedded in the foundation of the system and fueled by three singular uxorial customs, sati, enforced widowhood, and girl marriage, that kept the hierarchy of and male control in place through the disposal of surplus women and the accommodation or absorption of surplus men. Ambedkar's discussion on endogamy delineates a significant shift in social relations from exogamy in, in so-called primitive societies to the superimposition of endogamy on exogamy and the patriarchal strategies to maintain gender parity in marriageable units in this structural contra contradiction, violent by definition. For him, the tyranny of caste results in the enslavement of the soul itself. In each of these articulations, caste is tied to dignity and its intersectional extensions are tethered to the ability to rise above the violence of its snatched respect. If slavery, as Sanal Mohan shows, fragmented familial spaces for the slave castes, the humiliation and experience of denial of legitimate kinship leads to the crafting of a moral domain of kinship that spreads over the experiential, shielding the familial space, as it were, from privation and suffering and guaranteeing dignity, indeed privacy, through that process. This is a view that comes across powerfully in Om Prakash Valmiki's Juthan and in Dalit creative writing generally that situates violence at the foundation of caste. The data alone are staggering. The National Crime Records Bureau estimates that four Dalit women are raped, two murdered, and two homes torched every day. As Soundarajan so eloquently argues, India's culture of caste is so deeply entwined with gender violence, both because of the vulnerability it extends to Dalit women, 67% of whom have faced some sort of sexual violence, and the impunity it affords their perpetrators, creating a system of oppression and opportunism where each attempt at trying to bridge the gap by going to school or getting a job begets a greater risk of dis dis disapproval. The key to non-implementation of laws, in fact, lies here. Caste culture, in her words, is necessarily rape culture. Calling out this intersectionality of the gender Dalit experience, especially in the context of layered public privates, is the lament by Telugu poet Swaruparani. I quote, when has my life truly been mine, truly been mine? In the home, male arrogance sets my cheek stinging, while in the street, caste arrogance splits the other cheek open, unquote. Speaking of anti-caste radicals like Ayodhya Das, Mahatma Phule, Ramswami Periyar, and Baba Sahib Ambedkar, Vigita observes, and I quote, that principled ethical dissent of these philosophers in the face of routine monstrous caste violence and their call to a worldview that fosters equality, social compassion, freedom, and justice, I quote, were marked by a great ethical anger and social forbearance that did not ever lapse into violence. I quote from a composition in the Ambedkarite movement, one who says Jai Bhim knows the value of Jai Bhim. He knows that Baba's constitution is the real pride of India. Who says the nation stands on the rupee note? You must say only that which is true. My Bhima lifted the nation just on the nib of a pen." Unquote. It is in this re restatement of archaeologies of knowledge and a recon reconstruction of archives that the intellectual history of the idea of dignity elaborated in the Indian constitution may be reinstated. If Baba's constitution is the real pride of India, and if he lifted the nation just on the nib of a pen, what are the deep histories the constitution takes its birth from? The articulation of the right to privacy in a caste order can only draw on this genealogy and these pasts to make meaning of the future. An important part of this project 
is also to trace the shifts in meaning and equivocations, distortions even, importantly, that fuel the degradations and humiliation endemic in caste society today. The recent juridical and political discourse around the exclusion of women's entry into Sabarimala reminds us that caste is not just a cumulative category that adds to gender, but that in some ways, gender can perform violence, not unlike a caste-like apparatus, with exclusion and untouchability surrounding notions of purity. Our argument is not that gender and caste are equal kinds of violence. Instead, it is that the lived life of contemporary constitutional jurisprudence, in the lived life of contemporary constitutional jurisprudence, gender, gendering could take on a particular caste-like form of exclusion and discrimination, reminding us of the true and pervasive violence of any system based on ideologies of purity. But it also raises implications for privacy. What about the private rights of women within a visible public where they have been historically excluded? The full meanings of privacy as a right are unknown and lie undiscovered. They may not be uncovered by an examination of constitutional history alone, 70 years old in India, nor through the methods of comparative constitutional law. After all, Provisions like the proscription of untouchability have a specificity that is rooted in the histories of antisocialities on the subcontinent that must reveal themselves to us for purposes of a general understanding and constitutional interpretation. While the figure of Baba Sahib Ambedkar and more recently Savitri Bhai Pule find occasional mention in constitutional discourse and case law, the complex trajectories of anti-caste resistance that Ambedkar inherited, enriched and carried forward into modern constitutionalism is something that bears infinite recall. The cascading wealth of Dalit historiography provides us with several measures of constitutional morality. The rejection of the rule of caste as its core constitutive element. Chinaya Jangam's account, for instance, of the political mobilization of Dalits in Hyderabad state under the leadership of Bhagiradi Varma that predates Ambedkar, as also the emergence of similar collective consciousness in coastal Telugu regions, points towards, I quote, multiple articulations and diverse ideological streams among untouchables, unquote, also enabled by the modernization of capital and growth in opportunities for education and employment in the early 1900s. This growth in opportunities and the upward mobility it enables has had historically, has had regionally specific articulations in terms of the displacement of dominant caste Hindu imaginaries and the shaping of a new common sense of community or qualm as in ide ideas of dignity, as Surinder Jodhka demonstrates through his work on the Adharmis and Ravidasis in Eastern Punjab. If the mapping of the growth of political community and consciousness is one aspect of Dalit historiographical recovery, the other critical aspect is the interrogation of the representation of Dalit life and distortions therein that obfuscate the layered economic and political histories of Dalit communities in different parts of the subcontinent. Two historiographical accounts especially serve to underscore the importance of reconsidering untouchability and slavery in modern India. One from North India, the case of the Chamars, and the second from colonial Kerala, Ram Narayan Rawat and P. Saral Mohan, pointing the way towards genealogies of an anti-caste constitutionalism. These two accounts capture beautifully the rich and complex tapestry of Dalit assertion in early modern India, asserting their rights as peasant cultivators, destabilizing the dominant narrative of Chamars as leather workers and landless laborers, and resisting slavery through an assertion of social dignity and individual worth by a female member of a slave caste, as Sanal Mohan shows us. The two cases are also interesting, an interesting study and contrast, pointing to the diversity of Dalit subjectivities historically. If one goes by Buchanan Hamilton's 1813 account, 
recounted by Rawat, where he compared the conditions of Chamars in Malabar and South India, where they were slave castes to, the, to their condition in the Gangetic Belt, where they had direct access to the higher castes, even to their land, even to the landlord. We actually see that there is a vast regional diversity that remains unaddressed. In looking at the diversities in Dalit imaginations of the political, and in looking at the range of Dalit experiences of untouchability and caste-based discrimination, what is striking is the large gap between legal discourse within constitutional courts and historical experience. It seems like constitutional jurisprudence is trapped in a time warp. In order to decipher the meanings of dignity and its multiple cadences in the law, a close look at the contexts which gave rise to these articulations are indes indispensable as wayfinders. The gap, far from being insurmountable, can in fact be bridged by looking at the specific traditions of protest and the many different ways in which they reconfigured sensibilities in specific locales that led up to the specific constitutional protections that we have on, on, on paper today. Whether the enunciation of constitutional morality or the unprecedented constitutional criminal prohibition of untouchability. I move from here to the second pathway of dignity, reclaiming citizenship. The Hadia case brings up the question of religious conversion, especially conversion to Islam and the claim to dignity, privacy, and liberty for the female convert. Hadia's conversion takes us back to the fraught legal battles on the legitimacy of conversion under the constitution and the fact that conversion from Hinduism to Islam on the ground has a history. With the history of partition, conversion to Islam triggers a more visceral response from Hindu majoritarian, now supremacist public, than conversion to Christianity or other religions do. P.S. Krishnan, in his report on the Muslim backward classes, traces the history of conversions to Islam, observing pertinently for our present argument that the movement to Islam to escape the deep oppressions of caste and untouchability were quite common. The question of religious faith and the right to profess, practice, and propagate a religion of one's choice sits at the core of the right to privacy and is supported by all its signposts. The juridicalization of this right has been fragile in a courtly environment that is primed to majoritarian consciousness. As I have argued elsewhere, that the largely monolithic and majority-centric judicial view of history abridges the space for a full-blooded articulation of discrimination against religious minorities. There is no doubt that all religious minorities are rendered precarious under Hindu majoritarianism. However, in the context of citizenship debates, straddling the Constituent Assembly in 1948-49 and the term turmoil around the Citizenship Amendment Act 2019, it is on the de-citizenization of Muslims that the question of minority rights turns ultimately. The formal introduction of a denominational basis for the grant of citizenship under the CAA not just excludes Muslims, but actively persecutes Muslim minorities from non-Muslim countries like the Rohingya or even persecuted Muslim minority sects from Islamic countries. In doing so, it not merely traces, retracts an identity, it also, as Mahmoud Mabdani asked, argues, demonizes the Muslim using the legitimacy of the law. Mushir al Hassan called this profiling of Muslims, called this profiling of Muslims out in the aftermath of the demolition of the Babri Masjid in 1992. And we see its aftershocks in store for us tomorrow. I quote, a disquieting feature of the Hindutva wave has been not just the demolition of the Babri Masjid at Ayodhya, but the way Hindu propagandists conjured up the image of a community outside the national mainstream. Muslims were depicted as aggressive fundamentalists and demonized as descendants of depraved and tyrannical medieval rulers who demolished temples and forcibly converted Hindus to Islam." Unquote. This is from Mushir al-Hassan. 
although historically identity is based on religion were fluid with 200,000 people in Gujarat declaring themselves as Mohammedan Hindus in the 1911 census and there is no suggestion of a monolithic Muslim community the homogenization and flattening of religious identities now supported by the evisceration of universal citizenship is part of a longer process of Hindu state formation now rapidly consolidated through state power. Ghazala Jamil, speaking to this flattening out, observes pertinently that, I quote, while it is true that a majority of the Muslims in India are poor, I also knew it to be true from my own experience that Muslims of different classes are segregated together in many of these enclaves. The impulses of class-based divisions mix with communal logic to produce these geographies of discrimination, unquote. Mushirul Hassan, for instance, speaks of the early beginnings of this project in the newly independent India, when Muslim shops in Delhi and Uttar Pradesh were sealed by the Minister of Rehabilitation. When within a non-denominational constitutional framework, it was still possible for the Chief Minister of UP to declare that Muslims would not have access to public employment and discontinuing support to Urdu medium schools. When elected posts in the Congress were out of reach of Muslims, and I quote from Mushirul Hassan, 1991. States that shared borders with Pakistan were particularly fractured, volatile, and exclusionary for Muslims. Within this space of disentitlement, Muslim women have suffered a particularly acute structural disempowerment, as Zoya Hassan and Ritu Menon have pointed out. Tracing this trajectory, Abdul Shaban points to the array of stigmatizing descriptors that lock Muslims into an all-pervasive casualty, the carceral complex extending far beyond the securitized prison complex. The rolling out of a cross-border religious identity truncates the space for citizenship claims and for claims to protection under the Constitution by a delegated majoritarian surveillance. This in turn feeds into a majoritarian carceral regime that works at two levels. The first level simultaneously reduces the only Muslim majority state in the country, Kashmir, into a military camp through the erasure of statehood and military occupation. And diverse Muslim citizens in the rest of the country of basic citizenship rights through the CAA and through the operationalization of the National Register of Citizens that has seen mass detentions in camps, especially in the state of Assam. The second level at which this operates is through the incarceration and the use of draconian legislation like the Unlawful Activities Prevention Act on Muslim di di dissenters, on Muslim dissenters and those who support them, protesting the citizenship amendments and the disproportionate incarceration of Muslims on criminal charges in prisons across the country. Gender is critical to this violent politics of minoritization. With the twin interlocked processes of saving Muslim women, as we saw in Hadiyah's case, and incarcerating Muslim registers. Part of this is an increasing trend of incarcerating Muslim women, as we saw with Safura Zargar and Gulfisha, in an environment thick with genocidal priming that draws blood through caste Hindu male speech a male hate speech hinging on sexual humiliation and the threat of sexual assault. This moment presents to us an opportunity to map the fields of constitutionalism anew, inscribing decolonial visions of the constitution as commons, dignity, autonomy, self-determination, birthright and justice, drawing on a history of the present from the perspectives of the cascading resistance in the borderlands. And I conclude, how may we think, how may we rethink the idea of the right to privacy from Dalit, Muslim, and Adivasi standpoints? Urmila Power and Minakshi Moon provide a valuable account of the struggles by the first generation of Dalit women in the Ambedkarite movement who fought the violence of social exclusion organizing against religious prostitution, denial of education, fair labor standards, among others, foregrounding the specificity of struggles of Dalit women in a virulent caste order. 
Ghazala Jamil and Abdul Shaban, through their research on Muslim subjectivities and spatial geographies, point towards the pitfalls of the majoritarian gaze and governance on Muslim lives and worlds. The visceral relationship between segregated spatialities and processes of criminalization tied to segregations and the resistance that takes birth, transforming the space into a metaphor of justice and citizenship claims. And this is one that is critical to an understanding of belonging and birthright. Since these spaces and this resistance travel back and forth through the criminal justice system and constitutional courts, Section 144, sedition, public order, nuisance, free speech, freedom of association, right to life and personal liberty, among others, there is need for the right to privacy to find new decolonial pluriversal languages of justice within courts that shift the ontological ground on which the constitution rests, aligning it better with its everyday articulations in the lives of its birthright citizens. While it is outside the scope of this presentation to dwell on this at any length, a common thread that runs through these different political formations is the figure of the leader as mother, whether Kashmir or the Myra Paibis of Manipur or the Dadis of Shahin Bagh or the mothers in the Ambedkarite movement, life narratives, song and lament and resistance that reject our Brahmani traditions and embrace the meanings of other Azadi and freedom in all its hues and infuses privacy with meaning, self-respect, sororal fraternity, compassion, and empathy. And as transgender activist Gauri Savant reminds us, the mother is not necessarily cis female. The lullaby invoking Ambedkar is poignant. And I conclude with this. Sleep well, O oh little one. The whole world lies in the shadow of death. The lives of your parents were wasted. I'll feed you doses of Baba's courage. The dark night of the enemy has passed. It's dawn, my dear child. In your baby talk sings the bird of equality. In speaking about caste ways, lives, and topographies, we offer ways of seeing in which Dalit and Muslim interiorities help us reframe the questions of caste and majoritarianism in relation to the constitution and constitutional morality. Thank you very much. Thank you, ma'am, for your wonderful lecture. We, are, we have thoroughly enjoyed it. Now I would uh, like to request Dr. Kushita Gonsalves to conduct the question answer session. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. I hope I'm audible. Yeah, I can see. And uh, I, can I will ask. Yes. Thank you very much. Uh, the Constitution abolished untouchability as a practice, but the law could not undo this practice. When has my life been truly been mine? Thank you, ma'am, for wonderfully, wonderfully presenting the situation of women in India today. Women who continue to face endemic violence, caste and violence, which is too deep rooted, too sedimented, too internalized, too normalized, and too to make legal redress possible. Ma'am, there are some questions that have come over. So I would ask you, uh, I would tell the name of the person who has asked it. The first question is by Dr. Ishita Stuhl, uh, head of the department, Scottish Church College. The, her question is, is there any possibility of Dalit Muslim alliance overcoming sectarian isolation? And I'll take up two questions at a time, if you um, are okay with it. Yeah, sure. Um, the second question is by Shayantoni Odikari, and she says, do you believe if there is a chance of alliance between the upper caste feminist woman and lower caste woman who face various violences if yes how thank you um, yeah well um, the possibility of uh, Dalit Muslim Alliance of course uh, I think uh, that uh, we need alliances uh, at very very many different levels uh, and uh, there is no way that one can break the Hindu majoritarian 
uh, patriarchal juggernaut uh, without building solidarities and alliances on the ground, of which the Dalit Muslim Alliance is an extremely important and central component or constituent part of, uh, of the alliance, shall we say. Um, on, the, on the second, uh, you know, I think there has been a fairly uh, a long and um, intense debate on uh, the kinds of solidarities that uh, are possible uh, and that must be built between um, uh, Dalit and um, uh, Savarna groups, between Dalit feminists and Savarna feminists, between Muslim feminists, Savarna feminists, and so on. Uh, but I, I think that uh, the one uh, aspect of it uh, that has not been debated enough is what will, while solidarities are indispensable, and it is only through solidarities that mobilization can grow. What will the location of the expression of politics be? And this has come up in a very big way, uh, for instance, in the context of the protests against the CAA. All of us, for instance, know about the protests uh, in Shaheen Bagh, and Shaheen Bagh was one of the sites of protests. There were several like Shaheen Bagh where protests happened and there was uh, state action against uh, protesters. The, uh, the question uh, that needs to be debated is to what extent did this protest move from the locations that are uh, predominantly uh, inhabited by Dalit and minority communities to locations where you have a predominantly dominant caste Hindu uh, population. So the, the point is, is the uh, uh, basis of solidarity between Savarna and Dalit this uh, it is based on the protest at the site of Dalit resistance, or are Savarnas actually trying to change their own context, their families, their communities, their neighborhoods? Are they engaging with that uh, with that constituency uh, at the same and and, and uh, taking on the same level of personal risk to safety? in breaking the back of dominance within its belly itself. So I think the, the point is what are the sites of struggle? How may these sites of struggle be, uh, you know, uh, be uh, engaged with? And who may engage with these sites of struggle? So uh, solidarity there must be, but there must be a larger, a, a larger conversation on where the struggle will be located and what the modalities of that struggle will be. And there are several opinions on this, and we really need to start talking about the modalities of struggle rather than the composition of solidarities. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, there is another question uh, raised by Aliul Hawk, and he asks, will the abolition of triple talaq improve the situation? And uh, there is another part of it, our traditional social... Sorry, I can't hear you. Your voice is breaking. Can you just repeat that question? Yes. Uh, will the abolition of triple talaq improve the situation? Of that what? is what he's saying situation of women in the country and uh, there is another question by our vice principal sir dr shukrutin das he asks there are factors which disable alliances between feminism and other democratic political initiatives could you please elaborate on no, this no no a second question please between feminism and feminism and other democratic political initiatives. Could you elaborate on those factors? You know, on uh, on uh, the question on triple talaq, 
uh, I think there has been a very long standing movement by Muslim women in the country, in different parts of the country, who have engaged with the problem of triple talaq on the ground and who have, in fact, managed to uh, to to intervene in sites in, uh, of legal pluralism, uh, to uh, bring in a constitutional sensibility into uh, you know into customary uh, family law in different domains. And I, I if I remember right, uh, Ishita Sud also um, had focused on this in her doctoral work. The problem is not so much with the abolition of triple talaq. The problem is with its criminalization. And I think that what, and, and the problem is also with its criminalization at a particular moment in history. So yes, triple talaq is discriminatory. And this is not something new. This is not something I'm saying. This is not something the Supreme Court invented. This is something a 60-year-old woman, Shabanu, said in 1986. A 60-year-old Muslim woman said it in 1986. And a then 20-year-old Muslim woman, Shanaz Sheikh, said it in 1985 and went to court on that. So if today we are even able to talk about whether triple talaq is just or unjust, we just need to remember that the reason why triple talaq even came into the uh, domain of uh, in, into the public domain and into the domains of the courts was because Muslim women brought cases of maintenance and challenged triple talaq themselves. So yes, there has been a challenge that is almost 38, 39 years old against triple talaq. And there are various ways in which civil remedies can be instituted. The problem has to do with the criminalization and prison sentences, because criminalization and carceral politics is an extremely dangerous game that this particular government has been unraveling on very many different fronts. And so this then becomes another way of targeting Muslim men. And that is how it has been seen by people who have been opposing the, uh, uh, the move to legislate against triple talaq. The opposition is not a justification of the practice. The opposition is the uncalled for criminalization and criminal penalties imposed on people who are uh, uh, found guilty of triple talaq. Because courts have been dealing with it and petitioners have been dealing with it for a very long time with no interference from any government. And every time the government has intervened, it has become a totally, uh, you know, a, a totally fraught space where it then becomes very difficult to negotiate a reasonable ground for women to begin their deliberative politics. On feminism and other political movements, this is like a very short response to the triple talaq question. It is a very complex question. There are no flat and easy answers. But uh, I would urge you to look at the larger debates around triple talaq that have spent 35 years in India alone. Uh, on feminism and uh, other political initiatives, uh, also a very, very old question. We have work on the Tebhaga movement in uh, Bengal. We, we have work on the Telangana movement uh, in the 40s in uh, Andhra. Uh, we have uh, work on uh, various uh, social movements and new social movements, the civil liberties movement, uh, that has actually shown that the problem is not really between feminism and democratic problem politics. The problem is that democratic politics has largely presumed the subservience of women. So democratic politics constructs a private domain where women provide unpaid, unrecognized labor and are obstructed from leadership positions. And it is when women began, begin to raise these questions of internal democracy 
militating against patriarchal norms within democratic spaces, that this false question of feminism being in opposition to the democratic politics gets raised. It's not an opposition of feminism to democratic politics. It is the demand within democratic politics to democratize itself on the measure of gender. Thank you so much, ma'am, for explaining uh, the alliances so clearly. Uh, there was a question by uh, Professor Riddhi Bhattacharya, Department of History, Scottish Church College. And she asks, in these COVID times, the migrant women have become very visible. How do they exercise their economic rights and the question of their citizenship as they are not represented anywhere? And another question is by uh, Professor Shorwani Guha Ghoshal, and she asks the socioeconomic groups of. Sorry, I, sorry, I can't hear you. Yeah, Shorwani is a uh, question, please. Yes. The multiple socioeconomic groups of women will only allow favorable yeah. people either under threat will continue to subscribe to the caste culture. Is there any escape from all this? Thank you. No, so sorry, the, the Sharbani's question is if there is an escape from caste culture? From subscribing to the caste culture, especially for people who are under threat. Well, there's no, uh, uh, the, the, es the escape is the solution. To take Sharbani's question first. The escape and the rejection of caste culture is the resolution. If you are subservient to that, there is no resolution. You're just stuck in a very bad situation. And this is exactly what the entire, uh, uh, you know, the, the entire uh, stellar uh, uh, community of anti-caste philosophers uh, has placed before us. So it's not as if people who are uh, in extremely oppressed environments have not challenged the caste culture in very cogent ways. They have. So it's not as if the challenge to uh, caste hegemony um, uh, does not have a history. It has. And it has an extremely vibrant and live history. And that was part of the, uh, uh, you know, part of uh, what I attempted to do today was to put that history before us because I think we forget that history very often in, in, in trying to battle with how we are trapped in the present. I'm saying we have to recover our history. We were not always trapped in the present. And however much we were trapped in the present, we always broke free. So why is it that today we are not able to break free? Of course, we will break a limb. There is a risk. But the, uh, the reward is freedom. And if you if 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 you don't actually break that uh, you know uh, break that enclosure, then there is really no freedom from caste. So we might as well just not talk and accept Hindu majoritarian society as a given. Um, on on the question of uh, women and migrant labor uh, under COVID, you know, I what COVID actually uh, has brought to the fore. The lockdown, the lockout, the quarantines, the incarcerations, um, incarcerations and quarantine facilities, in jails, in homes. We have seen a surge in domestic violence as well during these times. What it has actually brought to the fore is the extreme forms of disentitlement and oppressions that women face in the normal course. And these oppressions and disentitlements, whether unequal wages, whether lack of control over decision making, whether lack of ability to approach uh, authorities for entitlements, uh, whether it freedom from sexual harassment and sexual violence. Look at what happened in the Araria case, for instance, where a victim of sexual harassment, uh, a survivor of, say, uh, of rape, of gang rape, was uh, sent to prison and counselors were sent to prison instead of the accused being uh, arrested. So the, 
the vulnerabilities of women that we see in COVID times are aggravated forms of the extreme vulnerabilities that women experience in normal times. And the, the position of the woman migrant worker is extremely precarious at the best of times. And what COVID does is that it simply encloses her physically within a space from which she simply cannot get out. But prior to COVID, even when she got out, the fact of her actually effectively being able to claim her entitlements was extremely limited. So what, we are, what, what COVID now shows us in a rather dramatic form is the extent of radical change we need in our society and polity in order to lay claim to the most basic, uh, to being a most basic democratic country in its most basic form. Thank you, ma'am. Another student from the Department of Political Science of our college, Scottish Church College, Samiksha Bharati asks a question. How do we look at gender privacy with special emphasis on the representative rights of women and especially of the LGBTQI community? And Shonita Mukherjee, the next question is by Shonita Mukherjee. She is a research scholar at the Center for Study of Social Sciences in Calcutta. She asks, how can we deconstruct the language of shame and exclusion in terms of ritualized prostitution or sorry mutualized what prostitution okay caste based prostitution in india today thank you no can you just ask her to clarify the second question because it's not clear to me okay uh, from uh, what I understand is, I think she's talking in uh, for the Devdasi system, which is ritualized prostitution and the language of shame and exclusion that these religious prostitutes who are also caste based because most of them belong to the lower castes. So how can we deconstruct their um, feelings, their languages of shame and exclusion that they are excluded from our society? That's okay. okay. On um, uh, the first question on the uh, gendered right to privacy, uh, and particularly with reference to the LGBTQI community, I think uh, what we um, in fact have, uh, and I, I have uh, uh, written, um, you know, a, a whole uh, article, uh, a research article just on that judgment, is uh, the Navtej Singh Johar uh, judgment uh, on uh, striking down Section 377 uh, of the IPC. Uh, but it's not simply uh, striking down 377. I think what the Navtej Johar judgment, in fact, does is that it uh, sets out in fairly elaborate ways uh, the ways in which uh, queer communities uh, yeah, the ways in which uh, the right to privacy may be elaborated in relation to queer communities. Uh, it uh, focuses on, uh, on rights and entitlements, on access to public spaces, on ex uh, access to familial rights, uh, on access to relationship, uh, and on access to legitimacy in the public domain, among other things. And uh, so I, I do think that uh, today, uh, after Nas Foundation, uh, and uh, then subsequently after Navte Johar, uh, after the Navte Johar judgment, uh, we do have a fairly elaborate um, articulation of the relationship between gendered privacy uh, and uh, queer rights. Uh, there are, and, and of course, uh, gender privacy does not have to do only with queer rights. Um, like I said, uh, the presentation I made was part of a book-length manuscript on gender and the right to privacy. 
uh, and of the several uh, areas we have explored there are uh, areas related to privacy in relation to women's familial rights, uh, privacy in relation to questions of consent. Um, uh, I did mention uh, Hadia's case very briefly. Uh, privacy from surveillance. Uh, yeah, we, of course, have uh, Aadhaar and uh, several other um, you know, uh, surveillance regimes uh, that infringe on the right to privacy. But we do need to look at uh, the question of gender privacy from the standpoint of fi feminist science and technology studies, FSDS, uh, to look at the meanings of gender privacy um, you know, uh, and, and the ways in which uh, uh, we might articulate that. We also have the question of uh, gender privacy in relation to women with disabilities uh, and, and uh, the ways in which uh, the rights of women with disabilities uh, may, uh, and uh, queer persons with disabilities may uh, actually be articulated um, within the larger sphere of privacy. And I do think that uh, you know the both the Puchiswami uh, judgment and later uh, the Navdeh Johar judgment uh, do allude to these various domains, uh, including caste and community and dress and appearance, uh, in uh, fairly uh, cogent ways. Uh, on uh, I, 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 on the Devdasi system, you know there has of late been uh, quite a huge discussion. Uh, on the Devdasi system. Uh, this was the subject of my uh, doctoral research uh, almost uh, 30 years ago. Uh, but uh, I do want to say uh, this much, uh, that it, you know this is uh, an extremely uh, complex debate um, and cannot be simply reduced to uh, talking about uh, Devdasis or, or, or women. They're, they're not uh, called Devadasis, but women from uh, Dalit communities uh, who are uh, dedicated to uh, gods and goddesses and temples. Uh, you have the Jogin system in, uh, uh, Andhra, in Andhra and Telangana. You have uh, the Yellamma cult. You have the, um, you know, the, the Jogtas. It, there's also a large transgender community that is involved, uh, you know, in, that, that is implicated in this practice. And uh, on the other hand, you have the situation uh, or you have the institutions in um, uh, the former Madras presidency, also Kerala. <coughs> what are par now parts of Kerala, where uh, there is a large uh, community of performers, singers, uh, and classical dancers uh, uh, who followed various uh, traditions of music and dance that are specific to region and temple, uh, whose history is quite different. And uh, you uh, can't, in fact, just reduce everything to sex work or prostitution. So if then you're talking about, uh, you know, a, a mutual, uh, whatever the term was that you were used, that you used, I uh, uh, have lost that term. But I'm saying, no, it's not a language of shame. But it's also not a reduction to sex work or prostitution. Where Dalit groups are concerned and where there is a forced uh, uh, dedication uh, as Devadasis within, um, uh, within, um, you know, within Dalit communities, rendering these women extremely vulnerable to uh, landlords and feudal uh, authorities within that particular village. There is, the exploitation is one of caste, which includes aggravated forms of sexual exploitation over a long term. And uh, Dalit groups and Dalit feminist groups, by and large, have been extremely uh, vocal in their opposition, and justifiably so, to this particular practice of dedication. But this practice is quite distinct from the performative traditions in South India, across different states, where it is not Dalit women who are, who, uh, are dedicated uh, to temples or who belong to temple traditions. Uh, the term that is used 
they, they are not, they need not be, I'm not saying they are not, they need not be monogamous, but the term that is used to describe their familial structures is not prostitution. It's not sex work. And there is no shame attached. On the other hand, with these performative traditions, what you have seen is a total appropriation of the dance form of, uh, of, of the space of the temple by Brahmanical and Brahmin women. Uh, and, and, a, and a complete dispossession of performative communities, rendering it illegal for them to perform in the temple, but rendering it pious obligation for Brahmin women to perform the same traditions within the temple. So there is at both ends, when you talk about the performative traditions, you are talking about a Brahminical and Brahmin appropriation of performative traditions in South India. Where you're talking about uh, 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 Devadasi traditions within Dalit communities, you are talking about a sexual appro appropriation and sexual exploitation that is also Brahmanical and upper caste of Dalit women within the areas where they are. So what is common is the Brahmanical appropriation. The effects of that Brahmanical ap appropriation and the description of the institutions varies really between one caste and another or between one caste cluster and another caste cluster. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am, for that uh, beautiful answer, especially to the caste system and prostitution. Two more of our students from the Department of Political Science have raised questions. The first one is by Orgo Mukherjee from the Department of Political Science, the student of semester five. He says, in India today, Muslim patriotism, Dalit's merit, and women's character are always questioned. Sorry? Muslim, Muslim patriotism, Dalit's merit, the yeah. merit of a Dalit person and the character of a woman are always under question. What is your uh, comments? What are your comments? No, I the last part, I, I get patriotism, merit and character are what? I, that is what is getting cut off. Yes, in India today, a Muslim person's no, patriot That I get, patriotism, yes. merit and yes. character I get. What is the last they are always They are always questioned in India today. Yeah. They are always questioned. Yeah. So what is your comments on this? Yeah, they are questioned, and that's what we are. Uh, uh, th that's that's what we are resisting, right? Yeah, I there think the answer is in the question. Okay, thank you, ma'am. Yes, uh, very clear, simply and uh, nicely stated. Uh, yes, Manisha, there is another question by another of our students in political science, and her name is Manisha Parida. She asks. With the use of draconian preventive detention laws that have shut down dissent and the deafening silence of institutions like the Supreme Court, the future for Indian civil society remains bleak. How can the masses overcome these hurdles? Thank you. But, you know, one of the things that I have been saying uh, of late, especially after uh, the kind of resistance uh, we have seen against the Citizenship Amendment Act, is to look at the Constitution as commons and um, not to depend on the Supreme Court for all the wisdom on the Constitution. We have to own the Constitution and we have to commit to ourselves and to each other to work it in our everyday lives and to make sure that our environments do not on an everyday basis militate against the constitution. Uh, it's not impossible to do this. I think that the resistance against the CAA has demonstrated uh, the immense possibilities uh, that uh, this uh, can actually enable. Uh, I also don't uh, subscribe to the, the you know, uh, to a view that separates us from the masses. We are the masses. We are part of that, that, that 
that animal that we call the masses. Uh, and, um, uh, and, and these are conversations uh, that we must have um, on an everyday level. And I believe that these conversations are happening on an everyday level. We need to recognize them. We, we still do have, uh, uh, we have uh, you know, uh, the, the fact, evidence of the fact that these conversations are happening on an everyday level um, it comes through to us, uh, for instance, from the insistence uh, of the uh, survivor in Araria to go and register an FIR against these men who assaulted her. Uh, in the face of trauma, in the face of being personally uh, in an extremely disempowered situation that probably would subscribe to this, this de definition of the masses, she went to uh, the uh, she she went to the police station, uh, registered an FIR, uh, and insisted that the magistrate reads out the statement to her, and she was hauled up for contempt and put in prison. So it's not the masses that are wanting in a consciousness of rights and what it means to be constitutionally aware. That lack of awareness is somewhere else. And we need to then be able to confront that lack of, uh, not just lack of awareness, but the unwillingness to work the constitution within courts and push courts to in fact respond to what we, as the masses, are saying the Constitution guarantees us. And this is part of the project of working the Constitution as commons. Thank you so much, ma'am. And the last question for uh, today's webinar has been raised by Shomnath Banerjee uh, from Bakura University, Department of Law. And he asks, how do we place or score the radical feminist movement in India today. Where is it located as of now? Thank you, ma'am. Uh, well, uh, you know, um, Somnath Babu, uh, the if you say in this country that patriarchy is not acceptable, caste supremacy is not acceptable. And even if patriarchy has a basis in religion, it is not acceptable. It is radical, radical feminism. But for women, there is no hope if you don't actually question patriarchy in the everyday. So it's not a question of relevance. It's a question of survival. And it is a question of survival with dignity for every woman in this country. Thank you so much, ma'am. Now, at the end of our session, I would once again like to thank you for this wonderful, exhaustive lecture that took us right from the beginnings from the Mathura case to Manorama to Vishaka, from Dr. Ambedkar and Fule. It was a long and beautiful journey that you took today. As we come to the end, I would request Dr. Shomrad Bhattacharya, coordinator IQAC of Scottish Church College, to kindly deliver the word. Uh, thank you, Sushmita. Uh, am I audible? Yes, you are. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, all of you. Uh, it is indeed a pleasure to accord the vote of thanks. I would begin by expressing my sincere gratitude to today's speaker, Professor Kalpana Kanabiran, for accepting our proposal to be the speaker of the day. Thank you, madam, for your illuminating lecture, which took us to an interesting world, much of which I'm sure will inspire our young scholars and students to venture on in future. My sincere thanks to our principal, Dr. Urpita Mukherjee, and vice principal, Dr. Shukrotin Das, for their continuous support and guidance. I am also reminded of all the other internal management committee members for their role in organizing today's webinar. I'm thankful to the head of Department of Political Science, 
Dr. Ishita Shur, who has played an instrumental role in organizing this webinar. Thanks to all the other departmental faculty members for their sincere effort and also for collaborating with the internal quality assurance cell of the college. My heartfelt thanks to Shrimati Nivedita Shaha and Sri Orun Kumar Chakraborty of Computer Science Department for rendering all the technical assistance. Finally, I am grateful to all our participants for their involvement, without which this webinar would not have been a success. In the end, my sincere apology for any interruption or inconvenience which might have been caused to anyone during the course of organizing this webinar. Thank you all once again and have a wonderful day. Thank you very much. Thank you for the invitation. Thank you, Dr. Shamrat Bhattacharya, for your vote of thanks. As we near the end, I would request all, all our participants to kindly fill up the feedback link that is shown in the chat box, following which you will receive the certificate in your mail. And once again, I thank all of you for being a part of this semi-webinar conducted by the Department of Political Science, Scottish Church College, along with the IQAC of Scottish Church College. Thank you once again. Thank you. And thank you, Shushmita, for your entire report and very nice uh, question answer. I mean, con I mean, the way you conducted the question and answer, that is really commendable. So big thank you to you and all the organizers, Kalpana Ma'am and the participants. Thank you very much. So let's, uh, I mean, finish it here. Yeah, formally we are ending the webinar of okay. the day. Thank you okay. all participants. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.